I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck, the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, too. Well, now that the holidays are over and a new year has begun, I'll bet you're back at school determined to make this the best year you ever had. Well, try hard, so I hope it'll be the best. Well, if you try, I'm sure it will. Well, like I said, I, I certainly will try. And I promise you, I'll do my best to have lots of good stories for you in the comics. Well, there's one particular special one that you know I'm anxious to hear you read today. Tell me, is it about a little boy who lost his shadow? Peter Pan. So could you read the funnies now? Puck the Comic Weekly. Mm -hmm. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <whistles> toot me a toot and tweet me a tweetle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <whistles> Today, Beetle is in the PX, which is the army store, where GIs can buy almost anything they need. Beetle goes up to the counter. Uh, a bottle of dark brown shoe polish, please. Right. There you are, sir. Beetle takes his bottle of polish, walks over to a table, sits down on a chair, and looks at his shoes. Eh, it wouldn't hurt anything to touch them up right here. He looks around for something to pour the shoe polish in so he can dip the dauber easily. Ah, here's a little dish I can pour some polish in. At that moment at the ice cream counter, two GIs are getting a dish of ice cream. The waitress tells them they'll find a dish of chocolate syrup on one of the tables if they want a flavor. So the fellows walk over to the table beside Beetle. They see the bowl with Beetle shoe polish in it, but think it's chocolate syrup, and they pour it on their ice cream, last picture, top row. Beetle, who has his back to them, singing gaily as he polishes his shoes, doesn't see what happens. One of the fellows takes a mouthful of what he thinks is ice cream with chocolate syrup on it, and then he says... Hey, you know, this syrup has a funny taste. I, uh, I, I can't quite place it. That moment, Beetle turns around to dip the dauber in the polish. First picture, bottom row. He sees the bowl is empty. Hey, who took my shoe polish? The G.I. who had eaten the shoe polish goes... Oh, that's it, shoe polish! Oh, no, I'm dying! And he rolls around on the floor in agony. His friend turns to Beetle and says, No, look what you did. You upset him. Hey, I'm the one who should be upset. It's my shoe polish. The waitress dashes over with a bottle of medicine and hands it to Beetle, who looks at the directions. It says, take entire bottle. The G.I. looks at his pal, who is rolling around the floor in agony, and sees the bottle of shoe polish on the table. He thinks it's a medicine and hands it to his friend, who gulps it right down. Hey, you feel better? Yeah, yeah, I feel better already. Beetle says... Hey, don't you even want your medicine? And the G.I. on the floor looks at the bottle he drank and sees he swallowed the rest of the shoe polish. Oh, no! He leaps to his feet and dives at Beetle. Why, you are fix you, you mothering idiot, you... There. And then he walks off, leaving Beetle looking like an old tree after a wild storm. Beetle staggers to the counter. Yes, sir? What can I do for you, sir? Uh... Another bottle of shoe polish. What? Hey, what are you doing with this stuff? Drinking it? <laughs> <laughs> that was really very funny, that man thing, the shoe polish with chocolate syrup. Yes, yeah, so and then <laughs> when they got the bottles mixed up, <laughs> he drank the shoe polish instead of the medicine. <laughs> Poor Beetle, he really has a terrible time of it, doesn't he? <laughs> yes, he certainly does. Oh, now is the time to read Peter Pan? Well, just about. Let's turn over the page... Go past little Iodine and Prince Valiant, who's trying to bring peace to his kingdom. Turn over another page. Go past Buzz Sawyer on page five. 
Turn over that page, over to page six. And look, here's Flash Gordon. You'll want to read that, won't you? Yes, because Flash is on the planet Venus, where he's been captured by that cruel King Stang. And last week, you remember, he saved the life of Krillir, one of King Stang's men. And then Krillir promised to help Flash, and he did. Yes, he took Flash to a room where he could talk to Dale. And Flash learned that Dale was the cook for King Stang now. And that gave Flash an idea. He gave Dale some kind of magic potion to be put in King Stang's food. But just... Just then, Queen Vicky opened the curtain, and when she saw them together, she was furious, and so she called the guards. I wonder what'll happen to Flash now. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon saskimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash and Krillier are sent to the dungeons by Queen Vicky. But King Stang, who likes the Earth-style food that Dale has been cooking, sends Dale back to the kitchen to cook for him. Queen Vicky warns King Stang that Dale will poison them all. And the tyrannical Stang is soon to find that Vicky's fear was well-founded. For last picture, top row, even though an armed guard watches her, at the first opportunity, Dale slips Zarkov's tasteless potion into the kettle of broth she is preparing for the king's table. First picture, bottom row, Dale brings King Stang, the first course of the dinner she's prepared for him. Her nerves are taut as she carries the drugged broth to the table. She pours some out. Stang accepts a cupful, raises it to his lips, and then sets it down with a cold smile. I'm sure the queen misjudged you, young lady. You wouldn't wish to poison your host, would you? But perhaps you would like to uh, sample this delicious broth. Dale has no choice. Numb with terror, she gulps the steaming broth. Then hurriedly fills all the cups on the royal table, knowing that she has only a few moments before the sleep potion will take effect. Last picture, one of the courtiers leaps to his feet. I propose a toast in broth to our sagacious king. <laughs> with cheers and laughter, the diners empty their cups. As Dale hurries out of the room, staggers and falls in a faint outside the portal. Oh, I wonder, was that broth poisoned? I don't know. It may be. There's something unusual in it to put her to sleep. Well, if it is, Dale will die, won't she? Well, unless somebody gets a doctor quickly, she might. Flesh can't help her. He's in the dungeon. I wonder what'll happen. Well, we'll find out next week. Now, let's go across the page to Peter Pan. Oh, yes, Peter Pan. And you remember, he had lost his shadow in the nursery of the Darling house last week. You remember? Yes, and Mr. and Mrs. Darling have gone off to a party. And all is quiet in the house. The children are asleep, but the window is open. And now, I'll bet you Peter will come to get his shadow with Tinkerbell. Hurry and read, please. Very well. Here we go with Peter Pan. Pirates, crocodiles, Peter Pie Pan. Whisk up music for Never Never Land. All is quiet in the nursery of the Darling Home in London as a figure that casts no shadow floats down to the sill and then steps in through the open window. He's followed by another figure. It's Peter's constant companion, Tinkerbell. Peter whispers, Hey, my shadow must be here, Tinkerbell. You look over there. I'll search this side. Tinkerbell darts about the room, looking one place and another for Peter's shadow, while Peter looks under the bed, behind the chairs, and in the children's toy trunk. First picture, bottom row, Tinkerbell sets up a big commotion. Peter rushes over and sees that she's pointing to the keyhole of a chest. Peter peeks in and exclaims, Hey, Tink, you found it! Quickly, Peter opens the drawer. But as the dresser drawer is opened, the captive shadow darts out. Around the room it goes, and after it, Peter goes. Up to the ceiling, down to the floor. But Peter lands on it, last picture. I gotcha! Which wakes up Wendy, who exclaims, Peter Pan! <laughs> How I love that Tinkerbell. She's so cute. Yes, yeah, so do I. And Peter, he's such a nice fellow, too, and very unusual. He's the only person I have ever known in my life who's lost a shadow. Oh, I lost mine once. When? One night when it was pitch black. I was in the middle of a forest, and I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. Did you put it there? I did, and I walked right into it. And the end of my nose has been flat ever since. Oh, you're teasing me. 
No, I'm not honest. <laughs> well, it's different losing your shadow in the dark. Peter lost his shadow in the daylight, and that, you must admit, is very unusual. I do admit it, and I do agree with you. It's very unusual. And maybe next week we'll find out what interesting conversation Wendy and Peter have. Now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, and I know we'll find them on the first page of the second section. And here they are, and here we go on the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly with Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Ramafoo, Ramafum, Zim, Zam, Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> It's late at night, way past Dagwood's bedtime, but he's deep in his chair reading a magazine. Blondie says to him, Dagwood, aren't you coming to bed? It's real late. Oh, this detective mystery story's too exciting to stop. But Blondie takes him by the arm and leads him upstairs. Well, now, look, I-, I won't be able to sleep until I finish it and find out who murdered rich old Mrs. Van Slapley. Finish your story in bed. <laughs> A little later, last picture, top row, they're all ready for bed. Dagwood and Blonde climb under the covers. Dagwood says, well, I'll kiss you goodnight, dear, so you, can, so you can go right to sleep. Yes, I'm terribly tired. There. Blonde rolls over and drops right off to sleep. And Dagwood continues to read his story. Now, let's see. Um, where was I? Oh, yes, yes, here. The black car with the Venetian blinds pulled up at the green house with the blue blondes. Oh, no, blinds. A half hour later, Blondie, buried in the pillow, sleeps on. And Dagwood, his face in his magazine, reads on. Mud on the horse's right side, he said. Aha, uh-huh, said Senor Saki. She and no one else stole my horse. She's the only one who rides side saddle. An hour later, Blondie, her face in her pillow, still sleeps. And Dagwood comes to the end of his story. Call off your dogs, you fool, said Sergeant Lewis. She may be a horse thief, but she's no killer. The man you want is... Oh, no, somebody cut it out. Second picture, second row, Dagwood yells, Blondie! Who cut the last paragraph of my story out of the magazine? Blondie wakens with a start, shakes the sleep out of her eyes, and says, last picture, second row. The ending of your story must have been on the other side of a cupcake recipe I cut out and gave to Mrs. Woodley. First picture, third row, the doorbell at the Woodley house rings. A moment later, Herb Woodley in his nightshirt opens the door, and Dagwood steps in. Hey, Herb, 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 I- I've got to have the cupcake recipe Blondie gave your wife today. Oh, no, no, cupcakes at two o'clock in the morning. A few minutes later, they're in the kitchen. Herb has opened the recipe book. Yeah, let's see. Ah, uh, here's the recipe. But it's glued in Tootsie's cooking scrapbook. Oh, good, good, good. We, we can loosen it by steaming it. Fifteen minutes later, last picture, third row, Herb is still in his nightshirt, leaning against the wall, sound asleep, as Dagward, holding the scrapbook over a kettle of steam, tries to loosen the recipe so he can see how his story ends. Yeah, yeah, it's coming loose. Hooray! I'll solve the mystery so I can go to sleep. First picture, bottom row, Dagwood peels the recipe out of the book, turns it over, and quickly reads. Then exclaims... Herb wakes up. Yeah? It was the butler who killed rich old Mrs. Van Slapley. Herb goes, And you woke me at 2 a.m. just to find that out? Why, you... And he leaps at Dagwood. And you know the rest. Last picture. Dagwood is back in bed again, sound asleep. A happy smile on his face, a black eye on his eye, dreaming of his story. Blondie sits up, shakes her head, looks at Dagwood with disgust. No use in me trying to go back to sleep. I'm wide awake for the night. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that crazy Dagwood, waking Herb Woodley and Blondie up just to see how the end of the story came out. (laughs) Yes, and doesn't he look funny? With a big smile on his face and a black (laughs) eye in his eye. Yes, he does. He certainly is a funny fellow, but I love him. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. Well, now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, look, there's Dick's Adventures. I'm anxious to read that. And I'll read it in just a moment. 
But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on page three of the second section, Dick's Adventures. Magic words for the music, please. Say them with me, please. Riggity pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Dick is dreaming that he's in the early days of America. The year is 1814. And the city, New Orleans, one of the most famous cities in the South. He dreams that he's with Major Gabriel Villers, having dinner at a sidewalk cafe, when a group of pirates come down the street. Dick is told that the most handsome and dashing of the pirates is Jean Lafitte, the most daring, courageous, and powerful pirate of his time. When Major Villers sees them approaching, he gets to his feet and tells Dick to come along. Dick doesn't move fast enough and a second later finds himself being lifted out of his chair by a couple of ruffians. Out of the way, boy, move! Hey, hey, let go of me, will you? Let go! Last picture, top row, Major Villers comes to Dick's rescue. Hey, let the boy go! Weapons flash. And for a moment, it looks like bloodshed until first picture, second row, Lafitte himself steps forward. Hey, Pierre André, that's enough. Put up your weapons. And then he turns to Dick and the Major. Hey, forgive the too hardy loyalty of my men. You will honor me by being my guest, huh? Dick and the Major join Lafitte at his table. And when they are seated, the Major asks, uh, Monsieur Lafitte, are you not afraid to show yourself so openly in New Orleans? General Jackson has put a price on your head. Lafitte smiles. <laughs> My head, uh, Major Villers, is at the disposal of those brave enough to take it. At this very instant, last picture, second row, one of Lafitte's men rushes up and reports, Hey, General Jackson, they come with a regiment of soldiers to see you. First picture, bottom row, Lafitte signals his men to leave. Then bows to his guests. Uh, gladly would I fight with the general, but I hesitate to attack the U.S. Army. Adieu. As the pirates hurry away, Major Villers says, hey, Lafitte is a scoundrel, yet in his heart he loves America. He and his men could do much to help us against the British enemy. But Dick hardly hears what he's saying. For last picture, Dick is looking at a woman's gold locket that he found under Lafitte's chair. Oh, I'm glad that Lafitte was nice to Dick and stopped his men from harming Dick. So am I. Well, Lafitte showed that he's afraid of General Jackson, didn't he? Well, at least he has respect for the American army. Oh, I wonder what that locket is that Dick found under Lafitte's chair. Well, next week, maybe we'll find out about that. Now look at the bottom of the page. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And Rusty Riley has run away and joined the carnival where his friend Stovepipe is. Yes, and I'm glad he has, because if Rusty must run away, I'm very happy that he has a good friend like Stovepipe to keep an eye on him and to help him. So am I, and you remember, the Stovepipe told Rusty to hide in an old shack, and so Rusty did. And while he was in the shack, he heard two evil men making plans to do something bad to Denver Dooley. Yes, Dooley is the owner of the carnival. I hope those two men don't to find out that Rusty's upstairs and, and has heard what they were saying or they're apt to hurt Rusty. Do you think that would happen? Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Quietly, Rusty listens as he hears the two men in the cabin below plotting. He hears the man named Speck say, Now listen, Beagle. When Dooley gets here tomorrow, I'll talk him into hiring us for our old pitch. And once we're on the inside, we can wait for our chance to pull off the job. Well, I don't know, Specs. We get caught. They'll throw the book at us. Ah, don't be so nervous. I used to wait twice what I do now. And I had a mustache then. Nobody will know me. And he never saw you before. So relax. Well, okay, Specs, you're the boss. Only I ain't in no hurry to go back to jail. Last picture, top row, Rusty says to himself, Golly, jail. They must be bad men. And they're planning to do something to Mr. Dooley. Oh, I wish I could see him, but they're just out of sight under the stairs. Next morning, first picture, bottom row, Rusty looks for stovepipe. 
he finds him washing up for breakfast. Stovepipe exclaims, Why, Rusty, my boy, what are you doing here? I thought I told you to wait in the shack till I came for you. Yeah, yes, I, I know it, Mr. Stovepipe, but something happened. I just had to tell you right away. Well, now, look, my boy, Dooley arrived last night, and he'll be up any minute. Uh, let's hie ourselves to a modest beanery and break our fast. Come along. Yeah, but I... Well, well, okay, Mr. Stovepipe. A little while later, third picture, bottom row, Rusty and Stovepipe are having breakfast in a restaurant nearby. Now then, Rusty, me lad, did you see a ghost? Or did the three bears come home and find you'd eaten their porridge? Please, Mr. Stovepipe, I'm not kidding. Those men are planning to hurt Mr. Dooley, and they mean to start by getting a job running a concession with his carnival. And Rusty goes on, last picture. I tried to see him, but I couldn't. But all we need to do is to see who gets a job in a concession, and that's them. Yes, my boy, ordinarily a logical conclusion. But I happen to know that Mr. Dooley means to add at least six new concessions. Oh, gee. Well, how are we going to find out who they are, then? I don't know, my boy. That's going to be a problem. Ooh, that will be a problem because Rusty doesn't know who they are or what they look like. Well, now, how would you hope to catch those men? Well, oh, oh I know. I'd go to every one of the concessions and listen to the men's voices, and maybe I could tell from their voices who they were. That's a very good idea. You're very clever. Yes, I am, am I? Yes, you are. Well, let's hope that Rusty does just that. And next week, we'll find out. Now, let's go over the page. Oh, look, here's Donald Duck, my favorite, favorite. And we won't waste a second. So here we go with your favorite, favorite Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeege em, squeege em, squid a chick a chat. Let's have music to fit a quack, quack. Today, Donald's three nephews, Huey, Louie, and Dewey, are going sliding. And second picture, they are at the foot of a snow-covered hill with two sleds and a long, long rope. They tie one end of the rope to one of the sleds and leave that sled at the foot of the hill. Then they start walking up the hill, uncoiling the rope as they go. At the top of the hill, they tie a pulley to a tree. And Dewey says... Now pull the rope through the pulley. So they run the rope through the pulley and tie it to the sled they brought with them to the top of the hill. Then Dewey exclaims, Get it? As we slide down on this sled, it pulls the other sled up. Huey says, Yeah. And Louie exclaims, Slick. The boys all get on the sled, preparing to slide down. At that moment, Donald, carrying a pair of skis, comes up the hill, last picture, top row. Not seeing the sled at the bottom of the hill, he says, Wow, 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 that's funny. A rope. So he steps over the rope, so one foot is on either side of it. First picture, bottom row, he says, Wonder where it goes. And with a rope between his legs, Donald starts up the hill. At that moment, down the hill come Louie, Huey, and Dewey on their sled. Hiya, Uncle Donald. And they shoot past Donald down the hill. And up the hill comes the empty sled that's tied to the rope. And since the rope is between Donald's legs, <laughs> it hits Donald in the seat of his pants. Ay! Tossing him up in the air and head under heels into the snow. And last picture, Huey, Louie, and Dewey run up and take one look at Donald's waving legs. And Dewey says, hey, how do you like that? Falls down before he even gets his skis on. <laughs> that was so funny. Yes, it was. How foolish can you be? Who'd ever think of straddling a rope and walking uphill with it between your legs? I wouldn't. I would look and see what the rope was tied to first. So would I. Oh, that Donald, he's some character. Yes, that Donald, he's some character. Well, now let's go across the page, because there's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes. And Roy and his friend Brimstone are taking the outlaws they captured to town to turn them over to the sheriff. When suddenly somebody came up the road yelling for help. And I'll bet you that means that Roy is starting a new adventure. Well, let's find out right now. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Hi yip hi yo now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip hi yo. <laughs> Oh, 
Roy and his friend Brimstone are on their way to town with the captured outlaws. Help! Help! Save me! Help! Save me! Roy sees a man running toward them. Hey, great guns, that's my old friend, Dofo Hawkins. Hey, just a minute, Dofo, calm down. Oh, Roy Rogers, am I glad to see you? Hey, you gotta help me. Roy dismounts and says to Brimstone, Hey, Brimstone, you deliver the Sphinx gang to the Pine City Sheriff. I'll be along after I see what's given Dofo the willies. Brimstone replies, Okay, Roy. All right, come on, you ornery Al Hoots, and no funny stuff. As the men ride off last picture top row, Roy leads Trigger and follows Doleful, who runs back down the road. Well, now, what's eating you, Doleful? You get attacked by an Indian war party? Hey, you don't know. You don't reckon a pass old redskins will bother me, do you? Twice is ten times worse. They come around a bend in the road, and Roy sees Doleful's wagon tipped over, leaning against a tree at the edge of a steep cliff. Hey, what happened here? That's the ore wagon I drive for the Bratton Freight Line, Roy. Hauling ore down from the Tomahawk Mine. Hey, look out, look out! Roy looks up to see a huge boulder crashing down the hill. They quickly jump aside. Yeah, he's at it again. Tell you, he ain't human. Now, you see what I mean? You don't know what I'm up against, Roy. Hey, over there, now, easy there, Trigger, easy. Roy draws his guns and looks up the hill and shouts, Hey, who's up there? Show your face or I'll come after you. Last picture, a young boy with a bow and arrow over his shoulder and a gun in each hand shouts down, Who dares challenge Tornado Tim Hawkins? Reach for the sky or I'll let you have it between the eyes. Why, that's the strangest thing I've ever seen. That's just a little boy up on that cliff. Yes, it is. Well, what in the world is he trying to do? Well, looks like he thinks he's a well-heeled outlaw and is trying to terrorize the countryside. Well, Roy shouldn't have any trouble taking care of him. Well, we'll find out if he does next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now, but be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.